Good evening. My name is Christoph Straub, and I'm the Senior Manager of Adult Learning here at TIFF. It's my distinct pleasure to welcome you to the third event of this year's Books on Film series, Imani Perry on a Raisin in the Sun. Before we begin, we'd like to acknowledge where tonight's event is taking place. We are on the treaty territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, and the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee, Anishinaabe, and the Huron-Wendat. We are grateful to have the opportunity to work in the community. On behalf of TIFF, I'd like to thank our lead sponsor, Bell, our major sponsors, RBC, L'Oreal Paris and Visa, and our major public supporters, the Government of Canada, the Government of Ontario, and the City of Toronto. We'd also like to thank our presenting partner for Books on Film, Warby Parker, our programming partner, Penguin Random House Canada, and our media partner, Star Metro. And thank you to donors and members like you for supporting TIFF's charitable mission to transform the way people see the world through film. Last but not least, a special shout out to the members of the Bad Girls Book Club Collective who join us in cinema tonight. Join them if you want to as well. Google them. Please stick around after the audience Q&A for an informal meet and greet with Imani inside the cinema, where there will be an opportunity to have your copies of her book, Looking for Lorraine, signed. And before I, before I hand over to our books and film host, just a reminder of two upcoming events in the series. On May 6th, screenwriter and producer Robin Swicord looks back at her 1994 adaptation of the Louisa May Alcott classic, Little Women, starring Winona Ryder, Kirsten Dunst, Claire Danes, and Christian Bale. Swicord, who received an Academy Award nomination for her work on The Curious Case of Benjamin Button, is also a produ producer on the highly anticipated new version of Little Women, directed by Greta Gerwig. And on June 3rd, award-winning Canadian poet, novelist, and essayist Michael Ondaatje revisits one of his favorite films, John Borman's Point Blank, the neo-noir thriller adapted from the novel by Richard Stark. Single tickets are still available for these events, and I hope you will be able to join us. And now, without further ado, it is my pleasure, and please join me in welcoming your founding host for Books on Film, Eleanor Wachtel. Thank you. Almost exactly 60 years ago, March 11, 1959, Lorraine Hansberry's debut play, A Raisin in the Sun, opened on Broadway. It was a groundbreaking occasion in many ways. Hansberry was the first African-American woman to have a play produced on Broadway. She was both the youngest and the first black winner of the prestigious Drama Critics Circle Award for Best American Play. Raisin was soon hailed as a classic alongside Arthur Miller's Death of a Salesman, Eugene O'Neill's Long Day's Journey into Night, and Tennessee Williams' A Streetcar Named Desire. Excuse me. <clears throat> but Broadway audiences had never before seen the work of a black playwright and black director, Lloyd Richards, featuring a black cast without a lot of singing, dancing, and slapstick. James Baldwin, who became friends with Lorraine Hansberry, later wrote that never in the history of American theater has so much of the truth of black people's lives been seen on the stage. Lorraine Hansberry was only 28 at the time. She was born in Chicago in May 1930, much the youngest of four children. Both her parents were from the South and college educated. Her mother from Tennessee was a teacher and ward leader. Her father from Mississippi was a real estate entrepreneur and civil rights activist who was the local secretary of the NAACP or National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. He came from an academic family. Both his father and brother were distinguished professors. While Lorraine's family was solidly middle class and financially comfortable, they lived in Chicago's South Side, in the same neighbors as the renters of Carl Hansbury, nicknamed the Kitchenette King, because of his converting three unit apartments, three unit apartment buildings into 10 unit flats, each with a partial kitchen, to accommodate the vast influx of African Americans into the city in the early 20th century. When Lorraine was seven, her father bought a house for the family in a nearby neighborhood, which was primarily white. A legal battle ensued, there was violence, we will discuss that later, but as you'll see, it left its mark on Lorraine. 
1950, after two years at the University of Wisconsin taking course in design and sculpture, Lorraine Hansberry moved to New York City, where she worked as a journalist for the left-wing civil rights newspaper Freedom, founded by actor and singer Paul Robeson. And W.E.B. Du Bois became her mentor and friend. When she was 23, she married a fellow radical, a Jewish communist songwriter, Robert Nemiroff, whom she met at a protest rally at NYU, where he was a graduate student. They were both part of the activist, intellectual, and artists populating Greenwich Village at the time, and Nemiroff became central in encouraging and facilitating Hansbury's writing. While they were together, even after they separated and divorced, and then as her literary executor, producing, promoting, and adapting her work after her tragically early death in 1965 at the age of 34. To go back to A Raisin in the Sun, it ran for more than two years on Broadway. It was published and staged worldwide in more than 30 languages. And as the most frequently produced work by an African-American playwright, it's had thousands of productions in the US, including revivals on Broadway in 2004 and 2014, the latter with Denzel Washington, when it won Tony Awards for Best Revival of a Play. Robert Nemiroff's 1974 musical called Raisin won the Tony Award for Best Musical. And there have been three screen versions. Two days after the Broadway opening, there were movie offers, and Hansbury was fearful of what she described, the glossy little paws of Hollywood. But she agreed because of the opportunity to reach a wider audience. She wanted to write the screenplay herself, and Columbia Pictures came in with a $300,000 for the movie rights and an additional $50,000 for the screenplay. The stars of the original stage production were retained, especially Sidney Poitier as Walter Lee, Ruby Dee as his wife, Claudia McNeil as his mother, and Diana Sands as his younger sister. But the studio dropped the director, Lloyd Richards, who later became dean of the Yale School of Drama because they claimed he had insufficient ex film experience. They turned to Daniel Petrie, a Canadian from Glace Bay, Nova Scotia. Just an aside, Lloyd Richards was actually born in Toronto, but he was raised in Detroit. After starting out as an actor, Daniel Petrie was hired by NBC Television in 1950 to work as a director, where, it made, where he made various TV series, including the DuPont Show of the Month, which featured films such as Wuthering Heights, starring Richard Burton in 1958. Petrie was later known for his 1981 movie, Fort Apache, The Bronx, and in 1984, The Bay Boy, a Cape Breton story starring Kiefer Sutherland. But most of his career was devoted to American TV movies, for which he won a couple of Emmys, Emmys and Director Guild Awards. Lorraine Hansberry was nominated by the Screen Actors Guild for Best Screenplay for A Raisin in the Sun, and she and Daniel Petrie won a special award at Cannes when the film was released in 1961. The movie ended up being a fairly faithful adaptation of the play, but Hansberry's screenplay was more ambitious and longer. And I will discuss this further with tonight's guest, Imani Perry, the author most recently of Looking for Lorraine, subtitled The Radiant and Radical Life of Lorraine Hansberry, a book that won the 2019 Penn Jacqueline Bogard Weld Award for Biography. Imani Perry, professor of African American studies at Princeton, first appeared in print at the age of three in the Birmingham, Alabama news in a photo of her and her parents at a protest against police brutality. She took her undergraduate degree at Yale, initially in math, but then switching to literature and American studies. She then got a PhD and a law degree at Harvard. Uh, an overachiever, what can I say? Amani has published widely on topics ranging from racial inequality to hip hop, her Lorraine's Hansbury title is her fifth book. Please welcome Imani Perry. Hello, everybody. <laughs> so um, just before we watch, the Nigerian student in the film, Asagai, was apparently Lorraine Hansberry's favorite character. It's yes. played by Ivan Dixon, who later became popular on television's Hogan's Heroes. Why was he a favorite of hers? Uh, I mean, what Lorraine Hansberry saw in him was an intellectual, someone who was much more measured than she was. 
Um, and also, um, you know, he had the insight of being inside the intimate sort of realm of the family, but also an outsider, right? And thinking about the questions of race in terms of global politics. You know, he was a, a young student organizer envisioning liberation for his unnamed home country. And so um, it was a gesture that would actually, that was actually reflective of her larger concerns with questions of race on a global scale. So, and he's also just incredibly brilliant and, and insightful. And handsome. Yeah. I just thought I'd you know, yeah, <laughs> no, yeah. yeah. Okay. Enjoy the show. Thanks. A Raisin in the Sun isn't exactly an autobiographical play, but I think it, it would, to better understand it, I'd like to go back to Lorraine Hansberry's background. Sure. Uh, tell me more about her family and upbringing. Um, so as you said earlier, she is the child of migrants from Tennessee and Mississippi, um, the child of uh, uh, Carl Augustus Hansberry, who was a real estate mogul. Um, but the details of A Raisin in the Sun are related to their life in the sense that um, they did try to purchase a home in, in, in a neighborhood that was covered, or they did purchase a home in a neighborhood that was covered by a racially restrictive covenant. Um, and those were private land agreements that um, uh, essentially said no black people could live in the neighborhood. Um, Carl Hansberry, as part of his sort of civil rights activism, purchased this home. The family occupied the home. Uh, the, Lorraine talks about walking to school and um, you know being having slurs yelled at her, being spat upon, her mother having to keep a gun on her lap to protect the household. Um, and ultimately, this led to litigation um, that went all the way up to the Supreme Court because they were forced to evacuate the home. And it turns out that the Hansberrys kept the property, but they were able to keep the property not because restrictive covenants were declared illegal at that time, but because it hadn't been um, accurately executed. So the court kind of evaded the question of, of residential segregation. But it was such um, a, 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 fa a, a kind of... Tra traumatic experience, but a foundational experience for her. So the younger family, in, in a sense, are entering into what she entered into as a young child. Um, she was seven years old. Um, and so, you know, she was really frustrated by people thinking that the end of the, of the film is a happy ending. It's a courageous ending, but she knows that they're entering into, and, and I just say that uh, desegregating kind of Residential desegregation in the Midwest um, was a very violent affair. So it wasn't simply, um, you know, mobs and yelling, but uh, but even death at times in response to black people moving into white neighborhoods. So it is um, it's an act of extraordinary courage. And she takes a piece of her life, but then of course puts it in a family that is very different from her home, her own a working class family, um, which is a very deliberate decision. But it's, it's, it's so complicated because, um, I mean, in, in terms of the ending has been a, a source of a lot of discussion yes. and audiences at the time for the play and the movie and many critics saw it as a happy ending mm -hmm. of family unity and morality triumphing over materialism, yeah. uh, assimilation successful. Uh, but Hansbury was very upset by this and she said oh, in response goodness. to one critic, if he thinks that's a happy ending, I invite him to live in one of the communities where the youngers are going. Mm -hmm. But it is complicated. She doesn't just, I mean, she, if she wanted to give us a, 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 a more straightforward, bleak ending, she could have done that. So this one is, yeah. is much more nuanced. Right, and the, the, the sense of joy at the ending, though, I think what she was hoping to render was what you were saying, a sense of family unity um, and integrity over, over, um, you know, over money, uh, and, and the courage of the family, and making meaning of the sacrifice of the father. Right. Um, and of their mother and of, I mean, you sort of sacrifice of everyone sort of making, um, you know, Hansberry talked about it as an affirmative deed. Sort of, and I think about, she thought about it as a step towards freedom. It wasn't going to yield necessarily a, um, a happy outcome, but it was an important action for people to take who were so, um, um, marginalized, so oppressed, right. So, um, and face so much adversity in every step of the way, right? And so, um, so it's a meaningful ending, if not, you know, a happy-go-lucky one. 
I, I think partly, uh, especially when we're seeing Sidney Poitier be so charming, mm -hmm. and <laughs> having just been at the uh, at the most desperate state that that I think in itself seduces the audience into thinking, because he gives us a big yeah. smile that is that is going to be happier. Yeah. But I, I want to go a little bit back to the, uh, the her family upbringing again, because um, as you said, her her father was a real estate mogul. He was known mm -hmm. as the kitchenette king mm -hmm. for converting apartments into tiny flats. And on the yeah. on the one hand, these accommodations were desperately needed by the new migrants to Chicago. But what do you make of his entrepreneurial enterprise? Well, um, so Lorraine herself had very mixed feelings about her father's politics and also his endeavors. Uh, and I got a sharper sense of this actually recently talking to her best friend from childhood who showed up at one of my readings, 88-year-old woman, extraordinary, brilliant, um, magnetic. And she said, you know, he, we did think of him as a slumlord um, and not terribly worse, not worse than anybody else, but that was sort of the condition of, of the, for poor and working class people mm -hmm. on the South side. And so, um, and, and certainly Lorraine had moments of deep shame about her, her family's status and particularly her mother's elitism vis-a-vis -vis other people in the neighborhood. One of the sort of most other sort of poignant childhood story for her is being, um, Christmas when she was six or seven years old being given a fur coat, a white fur coat. And this is in the midst of the depression, right? And she goes and she hated the coat and she said, I look like a big stupid rabbit in the coat. And she goes to school and is beat up as appropriate. And she- Is beat up as appropriate, did you say? As appropriate to wearing a fur coat where kids who are they're struggling to eat, right? And 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 I mean that in her in, interpretation. Her yeah. Her life, yeah. Uh, because she saw in the moment, it was just ostentatious and almost cruel. Um, and what's extraordinary is she identified with those kids who she fought, who you know she was defending herself against. And so th at a very young age, she had a sensitivity to class inequality. And she kind of carried that through her life. Um, and even though she admired her father, um, she thought he was a brilliant man, um, she profoundly disagreed with his political strategies. And she also said, and even though he won that case, Chicago was as segregated in 1964 as it was, you know, 1940. 1940, <clears throat> excuse me, 1940 when, when the decision yeah. came out. And, and it wasn't just that, as you were saying, her mother had to sit with a luger across her lap mm -hmm. and there was violence. There was a, a block of cement came through the window yeah, through that the almost, window, narrowly that almost her killed head. her. Yeah, it would have killed her if it hit her, if it had hit Lorraine's head, yeah. But after this, uh, Carl Hansbury gave up on America. Yes. Can you describe what happened? Um, you know, he had uh, he had that lawsuit, and he also sued a railroad company for um, segregation practices. And he, you know, she described her father as a real American type American. He was a loyal, you know, member of the Republican Party. He was deeply patriotic. Uh, patriotic. He was a capitalist, and he just gave up. Um, and he was so frustrated by uh, America's intransigence on the question of racial uh, equality, he did not want to be in the country any longer, moved to Mexico, purchased a home there, uh, and planned to move the entire family there. The, the, she was in high school at the time, and he had a brain aneurysm while in Mexico and died. Um, and so, you know, for her, she said, well, my father who did everything the right way, the way they tell you you're supposed to protest and struggle, and it was still too much for him. And she said he, you know, he died a bitter man in exile. Uh, and there's a way in which that shaped her politics, but I think it also kind of liberated her to look for um, questions around justice in a different direction. Um, and she became someone who's far to the left of her father politically, uh, although still influenced by him. Yeah, because I was going to ask you how and when did she develop her radical left-wing politics? Yeah, and it, well, it's it's a little bit hard to trace precisely. When she was a young teenager, they had a tenant named Ray Hansborough, who was not related to them, but who was a member of the Communist Party who mentored her. She was a voracious reader, not a particularly good student, but a really voracious reader. Um, she also, her uncle, William Leo Hansberry, who's really the father of the field of African studies and was a professor at Howard um, and, you know, um, educated lots of people who wound, wound up being kind of important figures in the independence movement. He mentored Namdi Azikiwe, who was the first president of Nigeria. He was around the home a lot. 
And so she was exposed to a wide array of politics. Um, he had been mentored by W.E.B. Du Bois and, and you know, was friends with Paul Robes. And so that sort of influence was present all the way through when she goes to Wisconsin. Yeah, why does she go to Wisconsin? Because I just to fill in yeah. here, I mean, she had these affiliations with these uh, traditionally black universities mm -hmm. through her, her uncle and even her grandfather. Oh, yeah. and, and that was the norm. And, right. and, and yeah, she chooses to go faculty. to... Uh, Mostly white, not very hospitable, not yeah. very welcoming university. Why, do you know why she chose it? I don't know why she chose it. I mean, it's interesting because uh, when she's thinking about colleges initially, she's written in her notebook, Howard University uh, and Wisconsin. And I think that Wisconsin, it has to do with the political activism at Wisconsin and also her interest in kind of stepping outside of the conventional paths. Um, you know, it was just the norm for a middle class young black woman to attend one of the uh, elite historically black colleges and universities. That was the conventional path and she was trying to step off of that. And so even though she integrated a dorm and there were very yeah, few black she students. She single-handedly integrated a dorm. She did. They had to audition her. They auditioned her for membership in the dorm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was pretty um, extraordinary. Yeah. Um, and because black students previously hadn't lived on campus and her mother insisted she had to live in a dormitory. She couldn't, you know, be in a rooming house or something. Um, but I think, you know, it was a, Wisconsin was an exciting place in 1948. You know, there was a lot going on. She became a campus leader involved in progressive politics, involved in the theater um, until she got restless. Got yeah. restless and then... And, and Dropped out. And Dropped out, yes. Went briefly to another college in Chicago and then moved to New York. Yes. And here she's writing articles, movie and theater criticism, but also about international colonialism. This yes. is for for Freedom, the, the periodical I re referred mm -hmm. to earlier that was uh, founded by Paul Robeson. Yes. And she's making connections between, as you pointed out, between the situations of blacks in America and in countries fighting for independence. Mm -hmm. She also wrote a bit of poetry and short stories. Yeah. But where did A Raisin in the Sun come from? Uh, so, um, she well, I, I will say she fell in love with theater while at Wisconsin. And so you get the beginning inklings that that might be her milieu, although initially she was a painter. Um, and she tries her hand at a lot of different forms. Um, it's really when she has the time for the first time to sit and write full time that a raisin in the sun emerges. And that is the consequence of her husband, Robert Nemiroff, having a, writing a song that was Cindy very o. successful. Cindy? Yes, Cindy O. Cindy. You have to tell the story. Right. So it's, uh, <laughs> it's a song that falls into the genre of the Calypso craze of the 1950s, which is sort of like watered down versions of Calypso music. Um, and it becomes a so hit. Sh for, should we sing it together? No. I know. <laughs> I would love for you to sing it. Well, <laughs> you know the song? Maybe you'll hear it. Cindy, oh, Cindy, Cindy, don't let me down. Take me da 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 da. That's the song, right? Yes. He made all kinds of money <laughs> with this song. Tons of money. So then she could, she could write full time. So that was it. Okay. Because yeah. I know in terms of the influence of theater, she saw Sean O'Casey's Juno and the Paycock, and uh -huh. that was a big influence. It's it a direct a, influence. Had a, a powerful mother and yeah. weak men. And yes. <laughs> oh, yeah. And, and she loved um, Sean O'Casey because he created beauty out of um, Irish brogue, and that inspired her to sort of think about ways composition that would take the language of black Americans and use that as a foundation for um, for art. Uh, and so, yeah, he's the most direct influence um, in the in the play and the work, yeah. So it was a question of having time that that, that led to raising the son. Sure, okay. and money. I mean, she you know, she was doing all sorts of things. She was waiting tables, she yeah. was, yeah. She worked at her parents-in-law's uh, restaurant. restaurant. Yeah. Communist family. Yes. Now, but I, I guess I should ask the sidebar, um, since she also described herself as a lesbian, why did she get married? Well, I don't entirely know the answer to that question beyond thinking that it was sort of the, the pressures of convention um, and also her mother, who was sort of like, what are you doing in New York? Um, you need to come home if you don't have a purpose. <laughs> uh, 
Um, she had she was in a relationship with a young black man named Rosie from the Labor Youth League prior to being involved in marrying Bobby. That relationship ended badly. He um, he was very enamored. He was very taken with her wealth, and that was not an identity that she wanted to grasp onto. And then he created all this confusion. She wound up having be getting put out of her apartment, and so both she and Bobby were kind of on the rebound. And and but I do think the question in terms of her sexuality was simply sort of social conventions. Um, but rather soon, I mean, before Raisin in the Sun hit Broadway and even before she was done completing it, it was clear that their romantic relationship was over, hers, hers and Robert Nemiroff's. Yeah, but he still maintained, um, I mean, they remained married, but he mm. also main, maintained a relationship as a close friend, the primary um, sort of person who encouraged her work, who facilitated her work, her interlocutor, all those sorts of things to the end of her life. Lorraine Hansbury thought that uh, Raisin in the Sun should have a strong figure at the center yeah. uh, rather than it being a, a more ensemble piece. And she wanted the, the Walter Lee character to be more like Willie Loman from, from Martha mm -hmm. Miller's Death of a Salesman. And I wondered, in fact, the initials are the same, yeah. Walter Lee, Willie Loman. I mean, what's your take on this? Um, I Well, one of the things, okay, so she did think that the failure of the play was that it did not have a strong central character. I think she was wrong in that assessment that in fact she's a master of the ensemble form and in all of her plays she really does something extraordinary where all of the characters have depth and the interaction between them is really um, quite beautiful and complex and also real. I mean, it's really how sort of families interact. But she also got really frustrated that people would, didn't make the connection to Willie Loman. And she thought that that was simply a function of racism. Like people didn't read A Raisin in the Sun in connection with the death of a salesman. And she wrote a piece in the Village Voice saying, you know, you guys, all these critics have talked about my play, and nobody has asked that question or thought about that relationship. But what do you think? Because I even even having read that, I, well, I still don't see the connection to Willie Loman. I see different kinds of aspirations and and frustrations. And well, I well, I think that though the the kind of um, I think the connection is the sort of what she thinks of as the soullessness of capitalism. And the way that shapes um, the psyches of American men, the saving grace for Walter Lee is that um, there's still some sense of purpose that comes from fighting against American racism. But the end for Willie Loman is kind of the end of the frontier. There's nothing else to strive for. That kind of emptiness. She sees that that's what Walter Lee is seeking, but then he understands that's actually meaningless. So he has a salvation that Willie Loman doesn't. So that's sort of the conversation she was trying to make between them. But yeah. uh, just to go back to explain a little bit uh, about Cindy O. Oh Cindy, it was Eddie Fisher fronting that song that is what made the first right. The, yeah, the, and then there, but there were like three hit versions of it or yeah. something. Yeah, and that made a lot of money. And so she writes the play. And do you want to describe the scene about how? they managed to find someone who had never produced a Broadway play before to produce it, Phil Rose. Yeah. So they, they um, Lorraine and Bobby had him over for spaghetti dinner. And um, they, you know, she read parts of the play to him and he was absolutely taken by it. But then it was very difficult to get the money to produce the play. And it was precisely because, you know, Black people on stage who weren't singing or dancing or laughing a lot was just not something that they anticipated could make a lot of money. So they did tryouts in various cities before coming to New York um, uh, and sort of, you know, in the hope and, and got a sense that it was going to be popular. Yeah. New, New Haven and Philadelphia, yes. which are actually typical pre-Broadway Pre, right, yeah, yeah. venues and so on. Yeah. And then it took about... I think a year and a half or something to, to get, get it to Broadway. Yeah, Broadway, and then it was a hit. Got standing it ovation. It was a hit. Yes, and, and changed the audience. Yeah, tell me what you mean by that. Well, so you know, and it's one of the things that Baldwin wrote about. But there had never been the sort of you know large numbers of black people on on Broadway, and he he described asking a theater goer, which is a kind of like you know one of the black women in the audience, 
you know, given how cheap a movie ticket why are, is, why are you here? And she said, because I heard that there was something happening here that has something to do with me. Um, and that uh, was extraordinary. And, you know, I mean, to just to get personal for a second, you know, just watching um, the conclusion of the film, uh, the depth of that is is quite profound. I mean, you know, so when there are things that Mrs. Younger says that because my grandmother was a domestic who raised me, she cleaned people's homes and had the same kind of ethical core, I see that has something to do with me, <laughs> right? 60 years later, I mean, it's sort of deeply resonant. It is... Didn't you say she helped educate 12 grandchildren? My Yes, my grandmother sent... 12 children to college out of segregated Alabama. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, she was, I mean, and, and um, but you know, the, the, the moment when uh, Mrs. Younger talks about life is freedom, I mean, that was her ethos. And for her, the sense of hope and aspiration had everything to do with values and not the desire to accumulate. Um, and so that's you know it's part of why it resonates so deeply. Yeah. And, and to audience members in, in, in general. Right? Yes, yeah. I think so. Yeah. Uh, let's talk a bit about Lane, Lorraine Hansberry's screenplay. It was published in the early 1990s. It was a project originally of, of Bobby Nemiroff, with a commentary by Spike Lee. Mm -hmm. um, what are some of the changes and enhancements that she wanted to make that were shot down by the yeah, studio? Yeah, she wanted there to be, for example, a scene with a street corner sort of political um, speaker talking about like black nationalism. She wanted there to be scenes where you could see the difference in the quality of pro, uh, produce and retail establishments in black and white neighborhoods. You could see. She, yeah, she she had, she had the mother go go to right try yeah. to try to just throw up, buy some produce at the at the local, and it was the quality was poor and the prices were higher than if she went to a right. white neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And also to have a real cityscape, so you could see the depth of. Uh, poverty on Chicago's South Side. So she was, and, and part of that was her wanting to make clear to many of her critics who saw, and especially critics actually on the left and members of the black left who said the play was just this sort of bourgeois middle class aspirational play that she didn't get what life was really like for working class people because of the family she came from and that's why everybody loved this place so much. She really was sort of attacked by members of her own political community and um, it frustrated her enormously. She did rewrites of both the play and wanted to make additions to the screenplay. Yeah, that didn't make it into the film. Yeah, And she wanted shots with the South Side Ghetto and was influenced by the I read somewhere she had a vision of like the Italian neorealists that yes. you know with mm -hmm. the, the streets and the politics and the poverty and and the and desperation that. have more references to Afri African colonialism more exterior shots. Um, the director uh, said at one point it meant the film would have been two hours and forty minutes instead of two hours and eight minutes. Elsewhere it said it would have been three hours. But do you think it was cut for length or no? I think for politics and you know and and. Um you know, appeal, right? I mean, so one of the conundrums is that while Lorraine was frustrated um, by the misperception, there is a real question about why it was so easy for so many, for such a large public to stomach the story, right? And, um, and you know, that was a difficult question for her, but it certainly was the case that perhaps not confronting the sort of the, the, the most painful and clear sort of markers of the depth of inequality um, made it easier for, for audiences to digest. And I am sure um, that the producers were concerned about that in the process. Yeah, so. Wouldn't it be amazing if there was a screenwriter's cut instead of, uh, as opposed to a director's cut? I mean, it would... Mm -hmm. Well, in the American Playhouse version, they try to include almost all of, of that, the 1988, but it's, as we were talking about, it's only available on VHS, so. <laughs> so sorry, unless you have an old VCR hanging around, you won't see it. <laughs> so. When and why did you first become interested in Lorraine Hansberry? Gosh, um, 
I keep being asked that question, and the reality is I, I don't know because I can't remember her not being a part of my consciousness. My father was a huge fan of Lorraine Hansberry. Uh, I watched this film version over and over again as a child. I saw stage productions. Um, Did he ever say why he liked it? Oh, because so my father was was a leftist, and so you know, and he lived in Chicago, and so you know, she was a radical leftist Chicago person, um, and he thought she was extraordinarily brilliant. In fact, um, after he died, I uh, one day I was I was on YouTube. He was a public health researcher, so sometimes his speeches would wind up on on YouTube, and I was looking to hear his voice. Um, cause I, and I had accidentally erased the last voicemail I had from him and I, so I turned on the video and he's giving this speech about breast cancer and behind him, there's a quote from Lorraine Hansberry from her essay on the scars of the ghetto. Um, and it, in the essay, she talks about how important it is to understand the nature of the problem, right? To understand that in order to, to do diagnostics. And he was making this point about, breast cancer research, and for me it was like a sign. I said, well, I have to write this book now, right? Um, so yeah, so she was always in my in my consciousness. I would tell one really quick story about it though. Yeah. When, um, when I was uh, on a fellowship at Princeton before I joined the faculty, I, um, I was doing, I wanted to do research on Robeson's newspaper, Freedom, and I'd known about Lorraine Hansberry my whole life, but I'm going through the microfiche, you know, of the paper, and I keep seeing her name, her name, her name. And all of these things that she's written, and I thought I, I thought I knew everything about her. And there's this archive of this, these newspaper articles that I, and so that was also a pull because I realized that even though I'd read everything published, that there was clearly all this other sort of work that she'd done and thinking that she'd done that I didn't yet have access to. And so that sort of pulled me further along into wanting to research her life and work. I have to ask, what do you think Eraser in the Sun has to say to us today? Oh, gosh, so much. I mean, certainly it's the case that um, economic inequality, residential segregation, um, these are still sort of pertinent issues, right? But I think on a deeper level, this question of what what is the purpose of life and freedom? And the question of sort of is um, sort of the drive for accumulation the way we respond to <laughs> inequality or histories of injustice? If you write them with, um, do you write them by sort of getting in the rat race or does it occasion thinking about how to live a meaningful life that um, is oriented to different kinds of values? Um, uh, I think those kinds of questions are at the forefront um, of the world right now, right? Um, and then all of the things about gender still persist, right? In this story, you know, beneath the story, and this this desire to sort of self-define and being sort of diminished and um, uh, and having her dreams minimized, and yet sort of being young and unsure, but also knowing there's something more there. Those questions are still, I mean, just, I just think, you know, um, 60 years later, we're still struggling with so many of the same things. Because Lorraine Hansberry said that Benita is the character that she most identified, or or at least was most like, like herself. Like her, yes. Yeah, yeah, she said she's a mess, right? And so she, <laughs> and, and but she agreed with everything she said. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but Hansberry tended to be, you know, kind of make fun of herself. It's one of the things that was kind of delightful about her personality. Is that, yeah. And, and what do you, about the Langston Hughes poem from which the title is made, the, the title is taken, yeah. What Happens to a Dream Deferred? Yeah. Um, How does that resonate today? Well, I mean, I think, you know, so the question, so the, the poem is, is um, published initially untitled in, um, in the crisis and then uh, is printed in a book of his under the title Harlem. So it's really... It's a it's a migration poem, and it at, and so when it's asking what happens to a dream deferred, does it dry up like a raisin in the sun, or fester like a sore and then run? Does it stink like rotten meat, or crust and sugar over like a syrupy sweet? Maybe it just sags like a heavy load, or does it explode? See, I, I could just sing Cindy, but Cindy, but she can recite the whole poem. <laughs> 
Langston Hughes is sort of, you know, it's, 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 he's, he's in my bones. Um, and was one of Lorraine's mentors. But the, the sense of like, you know, the, for the migrant, and these are the questions we're still asking, right? Whether we're talking about migration or immigration, right? There's hope that's attached to movement and when that hope is dashed and denied, right? What does that do to the inside of a person, right? And how does one sustain themselves in the face of, you know, the hopes being dashed? That's the question um, of the of the entire play, right? And and um, uh, so it, it, it continues to resonate, but I think that goes back to the point you're making. The part of the play that is hopeful is that she's having this family work through, right, not drying up like raisins in the sun, right? Um, um, yeah, and so it's a, now can I just say really quickly though, there's another poem that I think is as if not more influential to a raisin in the sun that she doesn't reference directly, but it's Gwendolyn Brooks' Kitchenette Building, yeah. which is a poem that really takes up this question in a different way. C can you recite that too? I cannot. It's a long <laughs> poem. <laughs> but there's a point where she talks about the fumes of, of, of cooking onions and the, the struggle for the bathroom that you see and whether dreams can exist there. And that's actually um, a Chicago poem. Uh, and so I, and she writes a ver she writes a kind of kitchenette poem herself when she's very young that is sort of like a knockoff of Gwendolyn Brooks' piece. It's not very good, but then the play is extraordinary. So she's definitely in a literary tradition when she's putting it together, yeah. Uh, we're gonna open to questions, so please wait till the microphone comes to you before you start. Anybody? Um, oh, we got one right here. Oh. May I? Okay, and um, then we'll get, get the front row after that. Okay, I, I have a question about um, the uh, play script and the movie script. And there's a speech in the play by Asagai that's very much the uh, um, resistance of the national struggle in Nigeria. Yes. And it's when the, the, the servants of the empire will step out of the woods and kill me, I am replenished. You know the speech, of course. Yes, the religion why? of doing what is necessary in the world. That yes. speech, yes. Why mm -hmm. is that left out of the movies? Well, um, so here's the complicated thing. That wasn't in the original um, stage production either. It's one of the rewrites. So depending on, this is one of the things that's actually frustrating to me about the, the ways in which A Raisin in the Sun has been printed because if you go into a store and purchase it, you don't necessarily know which copy you're buying. So that speech is actually, I think, in some ways, the kind of... Hmm? It's in that it's in one? one? Okay. Any, yes. Uh, any version I used in the schools, and, and when I put it on, uh, um, it, was all, it was always in. I never, saw a ver sorry, I never saw a version that didn't have it. Oh, yeah, there are versions that don't have oh, there it. Are, okay. I, sometimes Mrs. Johnson's left out, but um, I just find it disappointing, in the, in the, mm -hmm. I'll be honest with you, in the Hollywood films. Yeah, and then there's also the, the absent um, piece when she, she um, cuts off her straightened hair. Right, that doesn't, it's not on Broadway. So there's, I mean, there's a, a, a history of struggle around the productions, not just the film, but the stage productions and what will be included and what is consistent is that there are polit there's political content that winds up um, dropping out, yeah. Hmm? Front row. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much um, for writing this. Um, but my main question is, uh, can you give us two quotes of everything that you've read of hers? Um, one that resonated very deeply for you, for whatever reason that might be, and one that you feel uh, somehow miraculously still applies to the world today, despite the time past. Hmm. Well, I'll tell you one that I struggle with. Um, one of the things that she said is um, uh, the what she how did she how was it phrased I don't remember it exactly so it basically it's like if 
um, the thing that makes you extraordinary, if you are extraordinary in any way, is also the thing which makes you lonely. And it used to irritate me so much um, because it seemed like such a kind of snobbish quotation. Um, but I, I've, I've softened in relationship to it, and I think of it not as sort of extraordinary in the sense of superiority, but extraordinary in the sense of sort of doing some kind of seeking or being in relationship to the world that is unconventional. And the, if that becomes sort of what allows you to find your most meaningful contribution in the world, um, then that is something extraordinary, but it also is isolating. And as being in her papers and seeing the depth of her loneliness um, and the loneliness of people who she was really close to, like Baldwin and Nina Simone, um, that has sort of increasingly resonated with me and I'm kind of meditate, I've been meditating on it for, um, for years. Um, you know, I, it's the, <laughs> there's so many in terms of sort of ongoing significance, but, um, uh, the, the, the speech that she gave to young writers where, which became the foundation for the song that Nina Simone would dedicate, dedicate to her young gifted in black, in which she says that that's a, a, an extraordinary thing to be because she, uh, understands that there's such deep purpose in sort of confronting um, a painful history and bringing all your gifts to bear on it. I think that that, without question, has ongoing um, significance. Thank you. My question is more political. Um, I haven't done the math on when her death would have occurred, but was she affected strongly by McCarthyism, being a friend of Paul Ropes, and how did that affect her life? I'm so glad you asked that question. So uh, she, um, so when Paul, Ro Paul Robeson had his uh, passport revoked um, because of his um, political activism and being affiliated with the Communist Party, he sent her as a young woman, her early 20s, to Uruguay for an international peace conference on his behalf. Um, she, she lied to the State Department and said she was going to tour around Europe for the summer. Um, the, the, the peace conference was declared uh, illegal because it was affiliated with, with uh, the Communist Party. It was declared illegal by the United States, by many countries in Latin America. Lorraine went, had an extraordinarily beautiful time, uh, was deeply inspired, deeply connect, and, and um, should have spoke both in, on behalf of Robeson, but really also spoke uh, more broadly about the circumstances of black American women. And at any rate, when she came back, her passport was revoked. So, and then she was under FBI surveillance, essentially all the way through right, the success of A Raisin in the Sun. Uh, and what was interesting is that the FBI goes to the tryouts in Philadelphia and New Haven um, because um, they're trying to see if there's any subversive content to the play. And they determine there's no subversive content. And then at a certain point in her FBI file, there's this discussion like, well, she's getting really popular. And if we keep tailing her and people find out, it's going to look bad on the FBI. And that really ends the surveillance. Um, so yes, <laughs> she was she was um, sort of caught in the spokes of McCarthyism, and I think that's also it's it's important to think about because she bridges these generations. She's one of these figures who's both connected um, to lots of the activists of the '30s and '40s, and also with um, members of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee who are working in the Deep South. So she has this sort of bridge across different generations of political organizing in her life. Well, there was, there was, I mean, uh, there's a tragic dimension to that, too, because she, she raised money for uh, yeah. young men. You want to tell that story? Yeah, so um, her, I actually was just recently um, in, in the town where she bought her a cottage in the Hudson Valley, Croton on Hudson, and she held a very popular rally there. Um, to fit, raise money for CORE, which is one of the civil rights organizations um, working in the South. And, uh, and with the money you know, that she raised, purchased a station wagon for CORE. And that was the car the wag that Goodman, Schwerner, and Cheney were driving 
the night that they were pulled aside and murdered and, and then um, their bodies were thrown into a, a, the river. So it was, you know, in Mississippi, in the Mississippi Delta. Um, so she was kind of intimately connected with the movement and with the, the tragedies connected to it. In the middle there. Um, this, it's been such an interesting and heady discussion. I'm almost worried about asking this question because it sort of verges on trivia. Mm -hmm. But um, in watching the movie, I felt very fascinated by the character of the mother. Yes. And certainly by her appearance. And, um, you know, um, I just wondered, is was her hair, her clothing, her hats, was that an iconic thing? And if, and uh, what I kept thinking about was Oprah Renfrey and the color purple, mm -hmm. that they had a very, very strong relationship. And I wondered if you had any idea whether that was meant as a tribute to this character. Um, wait, who had a strong relationship? Um, I'm sorry. The visual relationship anyway was I'm referring to the character that Oprah Winfrey played in her first movie, which oh, was Sophia. Color Purple. Um, you know, I hadn't thought I hadn't thought about that. I mean, she dressed in a way that was con pretty conventional, um, and certainly hats and church hats are a huge part of African American culture. So that would be, you know, the sort of the hat the the hat for a kind of formal occasion or. Uh, which which sort of moving into this new ha neighborhood would be would be appropriate, but I had never thought about her as as connected um, to Sophia. But potentially that was something that um, to you know Oprah Winfrey's character, Miss Sophia, that that may have been some something that was a, a, a source of inspiration for for you know for Winfrey or or Spielberg in that in that film. And you're talking about all the people that she was connected to, including Malcolm X, who came yes, to her funeral. He did. Malcolm X came to her funeral, and it was extraordinary because he was in hiding at the time. He knew he was a, he was his life was at risk, um, and he stood outside with hundreds of people in the midst of a snowstorm, uh, and was killed you know, three and a half weeks later. Um, and they had had a contentious relationship because he had talked pretty badly about her marrying a white guy. And she took him to task for that. Lorraine was never shy about, you know, getting people together, as we say in black vernacular English, about, you know, kind of. Um, and he apologized. Um, and one of the things I often wind up saying to audiences, which I sometimes get astonishment from is that she was much more militant than Malcolm X was and much more and much further to the left politically. And so one of the things that's fascinating to think about is sort of how these iconic kind of figures of 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 the you know the civil rights movement or the freedom movement get cast as sort of these singular people in binary terms and they don't really think about them as part of communities, which often include people who had different kinds of ideas and even sometimes more challenging ideas than they did. Hi. Thank you for coming. Uh, my question is about the movie. Mm -hmm. uh, she wrote this play, and was the movie made after the play was successful? Yes. And then how did Sidney Poitier came into the movie and playing the movie? Is there a story about that? I mean, obviously, the people who play, who were in the movie were extremely talented, all mm -hmm. of them. So is there anything that is interesting and fun about, you know, how Sidney Poitier came to that role? Any stories there? Mm-hmm. Um, well, let me say that I am I'm not a theater studies person, and I begin by saying that because there are actually books coming that deal much in much greater detail about the sort of the dealings with the with the actors themselves and the details of the production. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, I will say that um, Sidney Poitier was already a very successful actor at the time. And it was a testament to how extraordinary the role of Walter Lee was that he agreed to be in this play that had been written by a relative unknown without having any way of knowing that it was going to be as successful as it was. So it wound up being an extraordinary vehicle for him. 
but he didn't need a raisin in the sun. You know, he just, uh, he really loved it. And, and well, in the, there's a documentary about Lorraine Hansberry. Mm -hmm. in, uh, that Which you should all see. P that PBS produced, uh, and they're part of their master series. And in that, they the connection that they weave between the, uh, origination, the originating the play and the Sidney Poitier role is that Phil Rose, who was... Uh, the producer, who's the man yeah. who, who mm -hmm. produced the play, uh, was uh, the head president of Glory Records, and uh, Sidney Poitier had recorded a book of, as they call them, Negro poems oh, for him. Oh, he sure did, yes. And so there was the connection that he at least had a contact for Sidney Poitier to approach him with the role in the first mm -hmm. place. But everyone from, almost everyone from the Play is in the movie. Yeah, this case. Yeah, and yeah. that's that's really uh, that's quite unusual. For Travis, yeah, yeah. Well, except for Travis, right? Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> who was who was, quite, who was played unusual. by a, a a boy who was Hansberry's downstairs neighbor, who became a very successful actor, Glenn Turman, but didn't make it into the film. Yeah. Okay, we have a, a last question in the back there. Oh, we have someone waving here. Is that a priority? Yes, priority. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Thanks so much for being here. Um, so in the film. There's a moment where Walter Lee tells George that, you know, he's in school studying the ologies mm -hmm. and then is constantly telling his sister that she's brainwashed, right? Or she's going to brainwash herself, the first mm -hmm. person in history. And yet she's the first person to recognize what's happening when the representative from the Home Improvement Association enters the house, mm -hmm. right? So I just wanted to know if you had any thoughts on the, I guess just the valuation placed on these areas of study when it comes to, you know, educating future generations of like black scholars and thinkers. Yeah, um, I mean, so we're, I, you know, so I'll, I'll say this, we're supposed to understand the tensions between uh, Beneath and, Walk, and Walter Lee is both kind of you know, your standard sibling rivalry, but also the tensions that are about gender um, and ideas about manhood and particular Walter Lee's sense of anxiety about a kind of insecure social position. Um, and, and also prospective class tensions, because while they're still in the same house, it's clear that Benita is aspiring to a kind of um, different status. Um, I, one of the, the, you know, for people who are Raisin in the Sun nerds, one of the best books to read, and it's it's like 800 pages long, but it is um, um, called Black Metropolis, and it is the product of the WPA's Negro in Illinois project, uh, which is a sort of comprehensive sociological survey of Chicago. And you can actually see all of the characters' social positions, like, their class position, their way, the way they fit in the black community, analyzed on this deep sociological level in that sort of seven, 800 page book. And it's very clear that um, Hansberry was thinking a lot about that. And she, the chapter on chauffeurs where she taught, it, which where it talks about chauffeurs kind of being alienated from traditional forms of labor begin to have this desire to be like the super elite men who they drive around. Um, and so she makes that manifest in Walter Lee. So um, so on the one hand, right, she's an intellectual. She obviously values education, but she also sees uh, beneath his short-sightedness that emerges at other points um, around her um, kind of uh, the way she dismisses Walter Lee. And I'll just say something really quickly, because um, I know we have to end, but um, there's a way that, Okay, so if you're all familiar with um, Native Son, which just has a new film version that came out, it's a classic novel by Richard Wright that takes place in Chicago that really was sort of the classic black Chicago novel. And in that novel, it begins with a scene where the main character, Bigger, is killing a rat. And it, the rat is supposed to be symbolic of Bigger, right? Like living in the slums in Chicago is essentially like being a rat. And the whole novel is about the way these conditions distort the personality. And in this play, when Beneath the Top describes Walter Lee as a toothless rat, that's the moment of her ethical failure. And so Hansberry is rewriting that scene and saying, wait, no, this way of analyzing the person in the position of Walter Lee 
or bigger Thomas is absolutely wrong so that even with all her intellectual aspirations, she misses something fundamental um, ethically. And so, uh, you know, so that's why none of the characters are, um, are ideal. They're all sort of grasping on partial knowledge, right? And also on sort of the, and, and hope and aspirations for freedom. And I think that's part of what makes it so um, authentic as a, as a work. Thank you. I'd like to thank Amani Perry for coming and also to tell you that she'll be here if you want to have her sign books. Thank you so much. Thanks. <laughs>